Welcome. I am here with Les Johnson, scientist, author, and NASA technologist. Today, we're going to talk about various types of propulsion systems. Les, welcome, my friend. Oh, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. I'm looking forward to seeing you again in person. We don't do that these days very often. Yeah, exactly. Hey, before we get started, I better give a quick caveat. You mentioned I do work for NASA, and I do. I've been there for over 30 years. You can tell I'm a little follically challenged, but... I have to let everybody know that I do interviews like this that are related to my books and things I talk about outside of work. So anything I say is my own opinion. doesn't reflect NASA, and uh, it's it just basically Les's opinion. So just want to get that out of the way up front. All right, Les. I, I think we'll just start out with if you could just to level set for the audience the various types of propulsion systems. And if you could kind of just first just list them out, and then we could attack one each at a time. But in in that order, and I know I'm, I'm doing this in real time, all that stuff, so not to trip you up, but if you could kind of organize them as most realistic or most achievable to more exotic in science fiction all the way to the woo-woo. All the way to the woo-woo. Yeah, sure. I'll be glad to do that. Just to give those who are listening a little bit of context, in my career as a frame physicist, I've really worked mostly on advanced in-space propulsion. Now, what I mean by in-space propulsion is not the thing that gets you from the ground to space, although I've dabbled in that a bit. That's usually rockets for reasons that you have to have high thrust to get out of this heavy gravity well that we find ourselves on on planet Earth, right? But after you get up about 1,000 miles, not even that, really about 500 miles, the heavy lifting is over from the rocket. And that's a good thing because rockets are, are really darn inefficient. And what I work on are the propulsion systems for spacecraft to take them the next billion miles. <laughs> and I, I joke with my colleagues at work, you know, you're working on these rockets and that's great, but you know, that's so 20th century. I'm working on the 21st century and beyond kind of thing. So I'm at the front end of some new propulsion technologies. And in my career, I, I managed NASA's in-space propulsion technology project for a few years where we advanced the maturity of several of those. And I had the coolest job title in the universe for about two years, and it was the manager of NASA's Interstellar Propulsion Technology Research Project. And that's where I got to dabble in the what-ifs, then the known laws of physics, what kind of propulsion can we do in the future? And so as I answer your question, I'll go from the realistic to the woo-woo, you know, and the gee whiz, and I hope we can do that someday, and, and hopefully that'll help. But just to begin, we'll start out with rockets. Yep. And for rockets, just simplicity, all right? Imagine that you're standing on a skateboard and you have a bowling ball and a basketball and you stand there and you throw the basketball this way. Intuition says, because you've done this before, as you throw the ball that way, you're going to recoil this way. That's a rocket. Okay. It's conservation of momentum. So the mass of me times my velocity this way is going to be equal to the mass of the basketball and its velocity that way. So it's going to go a lot faster because it's lighter weight. I'm heavier, so I'll go slower. And that's basically conservation of momentum. And that's how a rocket works. You add this up going this way to what went that way, and the answer is zero. Now I'm neglecting and, and friction and all that stuff. the mass is changing, right? Because of the well, it is. The that's right. Goes. If it's a rocket. In my simple one, it's very simple. I had one thing thrown out that way and one this other. Yeah, when it's changing, then you get complications. You have what's called the rocket equation. And that's really useful, but there gets a point where on a rocket that you add more fuel to thrust longer, but that adds to the weight that you have to push against where you begin, which means you need more fuel than you would have needed to get to a certain speed before you added that extra weight, which means you have to add yet more fuel. And eventually you get a point of diminishing returns where it doesn't make sense anymore to add more fuel because you don't go anywhere because you don't get off the pad because you're too heavy. And so that's really the drawback with rockets. And conventional chemical rockets, where you see a lot of fire and smoke, those are great. But it's all based on making and breaking chemical bonds. That's where the energy comes from. To heat the propellant, a temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy, the energy of motion of a propellant, right? And so when you have a rocket engine and you see that, that flame coming out and the rocket exhaust coming out, you want to heat it up as hot as you can to get it moving as fast as it can. So there's as much momentum as possible coming out the back of the rocket because that momentum is going to translate into the rocket's momentum to go in the other direction. So a chemical rocket is based on chemistry. That's why it's called a chemical rocket. And 
I like to point back to the space shuttle era, and there are a lot of rockets today that do the same kind of propulsion because it's really a good rocket. It's oxygen hydrogen, where you have a, a tank of liquid oxygen. You have to keep it really cold. A, a tank of liquid uh, hydrogen, one of hot oxygen, keep them both really cold. You, you burn them. The byproduct is water vapor. It's steam, right? But it's really hot. And it's coming out pretty fast, and that's what made the shuttle's main engines get off the ground. So on a shuttle launch, before the socket rocket motors really kicked in, that's a different story. All that white smoke coming up was not smoke. That was steam. It was water vapor. LOX hydrogen propulsion systems don't pollute. It's just steam. Now, the solid rocket motors, they did. They had perchlorate. They've got all kinds of combustibles, and they did pollute some, right? And we still use both of those today. The Space Launch System was LOX hydrogen core, solid rocket motors on the side. So that, that's really how a chemical rocket works. And there's a limit to how fast and how efficient rockets can be because there's only so much energy you can get out of them by making or breaking chemical bonds. Okay. So in the case of LOX hydrogen, you're making water, you're taking hydrogen and oxygen and making water, the energy released and the chemistry of that is what gives you the thrust. There are LOX kerosene, different things that are burned, but that's essentially a chemical engine. And, and there's a figure of merit that rocket scientists use to measure the performance of, of any rocket. It's called the specific impulse, and the abbreviation is ISP. So you might hear me use those interchangeably in this discussion. And essentially, it's just a measure of the efficiency of the rocket. And like miles per gallon, and ISP is not miles per gallon, for obscure reasons, it's in seconds. The higher the number, the more efficient the rocket, which tells you how much total push you can get per pound of fuel. All right? So you want a very high ISP. And rockets peak out around 400 seconds. That's about the limit of what you can get from a chemical rocket. And that's pretty much almost all the rockets we use today, but not all. There are electric rockets, which I can go into, but let me see if you have any questions about the chemical rockets. Yeah, for chemical rockets, is there a maximum kind of G in terms of the force that they're pushing on the, the astronauts, or is that set more by the astronauts than by the rocket? Uh, that there's no straightforward answer to that. And, and the reason I say that is if you look at different rockets for different applications, in defense, there are a lot of missiles. And those missiles have high thrust, but they're small. So when those rockets take off, man, the, the G-forces are high. Those things are gone, right? Because they're intercepting another missile coming in, and they got to get there quickly or they're going to miss. So they really maximize thrust and low mass, so they have a very high acceleration. Physics. Force equals mass times acceleration, all right? That drives everything on a rocket. The force is derived from the chemistry of what's in the engine and how much fuel there's in there. But it's equal to the mass of that fuel to calculate the acceleration, right? So if the, you have a low mass system with a pretty high thrust force, you can get a big acceleration. And that's what you have on these rocket interceptors. When you go to something like the shuttle, where it just slowly went off, or the classic pictures of the Saturn V, where when it starts, you wonder, is this thing going to get off the ground? You know, those are relatively low G-forces because the rocket was so big, right? So there is a limit to what astronauts can sustain, and they do constrain it to that because you don't want your astronauts to get killed or pass out. But it's also driven by the mass of your system and the system. So, what yes, there probably for, is a G limit, but it's not really a driver for most applications. So what is that number for astronauts, Jim, just out of curiosity? Oh, boy, that's a good question. I think it's somewhere between four and eight Gs. I think they can sustain pretty high G loads for very brief amounts of time, like seconds <laughs> or fractions of a second. But sustained G loading, you want it to be much lower. And I really don't know the number for crew. Okay. Like lux hydrogen, does that just mean liquid oxygen hydrogen? Lux hydrogen. I'm sorry. Yeah, Lock, liquid oxygen. L O X. Liquid right, oxygen, and and then uh, liquid hydrogen. Yeah, you're correct. Okay. Sorry, no, it's no, hard it's not to helpful. acronymize everything when you work for NASA. <laughs> no, that's why you're doing so, this, so people yeah. people understand. Okay, so so that's the chemical rockets. Right. Uh, the next is solid state. Oh, no. Solid rockets are also chemical rockets, but instead of liquid fuel, they use solid fuel. 
if any of the uh, folks watching or listening to this have ever built those little SDs rocket kits, which are a lot of fun. I did that when I was a kid, little model rockets that go up about a thousand feet. They used a solid rocket motor instead of liquid. And it's still chemistry. It's still a propellant. It burns, it expels a hot gas and it gets its thrust. So it, it's just a different way to do it. Solids are more portable. You don't have to keep them super cold like you do with liquid hydrogen or liquid oxygen. They have a role to play. They tend to produce higher thrust, which would mean high accelerations. The drawback to most solid rocket motors, though, is you can't throttle them easily. In other words, you can't vary the thrust during flight. With a chemical engine, you can vary the amount of propellant, and you can basically slow down. It's like you know shifting gears in a car. Solid rocket motors, you light them, and buddy, they go until they run out of fuel generally speaking. So, you know, if you're on one of those, you light it and it's going to go and it's going to keep going until it's out of gas. Whereas the same size chemical rocket, you could you could slow down the fuel flow, reduce your acceleration or increase your acceleration, but you don't have that kind of control with most solids. There are some exceptions, some pretty complicated systems to throttle them, but very few. So chemical rockets are the ones that are in common use now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. They are what you're going to use for the foreseeable future to get off the ground, to go into space. And I, I work with and have known a lot of rocket scientists in my career, and they're really smart people. And these rockets are really complicated. But I always tell them they have the easy job because I've spent most of my career working on what's called an in-space propulsion system, which are the systems that after you get into space from the ground, you use them. And you don't have to get out of the gravity well. And when you don't have to fight gravity as much, you can think about efficiency and not necessarily high thrust. So I jokingly tell all my rocket scientist friends, you know, that stuff's 20th century. <laughs> you know, that's last century stuff. I'm going to work on, you know, 21st and 22nd century stuff. And to an extent that that's true, but I don't want to minimize how hard rocket science is because it's really complicated. Are there um, any intermediate modes between rocket and space? like? ramjet kind of oh yeah oh yeah i'll get to that let, let me flow into the next thing the next thing is a really cool propulsion rocket it's called electric propulsion or ion propulsion or if you're a classic star trek fan you heard scotty marvel it they have ion drive and why anyone who had a antimatter mixer that drove a warp drive would be excited about someone having ion propulsion i don't know because <laughs> compared to the enterprise it's pretty primitive but Ion propulsion is still a rocket. You're throwing fuel out the back. But in order to get it to move and accelerate that fuel, you're not using the energy of chemistry anymore. You're using electromagnetism. So what you do is you have your propellant and you ionize it by either adding an electron or removing an electron. And there's an interesting property of ions in electric and magnetic fields. And that is that electric fields like that generated between two parallel plates, a high voltage across two plates. Capacitor, right. Capacitor, if you put a charged particle in there, it's going to feel a force from that electric field between these plates. And if you pass a charged particle in a magnetic field, it's going to bend and it's going to experience a force as it moves through that field. So in an... The, the right-hand rule, that, that's exactly right. Um, Faraday's law of induction. Right. And, and, and then you also get the I cross L force, which is, the, this is really the right hand rule, not this. That was my mistake. Sorry. It's the right hand rule. So the force it feels is perpendicular to the direction of motion of the charged particle and the magnetic field. So if the field's going this way and the particle gets shot in this way, it's going to curve up this way. All right. Perpendicular to both of those. Well, if you have a really strong magnetic field or electric field or both, and you shoot ions in there, the, the, the fields will accelerate them to really high speeds and out the back of the rocket. And the beauty of that is you get a lot more efficient use of propellant. And you can get ISPs, miles per gallon, specific impulse, from a few hundred seconds to a few thousand seconds. Oh, wow. So, which means so you said earlier at the very beginning, you said 400 seconds was the best we could do with chemical rockets. It is, about that. You know, maybe a little bit higher. Average is about there. An ion propulsion or electric propulsion system, there have been those with measured efficiencies up to 10,000 seconds, which is really nice. But there's a drawback. They're low thrust, which means instead of a million pounds of thrust to get off the ground like you had with Saturn V, you, you get fractions of a pound. But you get it 
over long periods of time. And over time, that can accelerate you to much higher speeds, give you a lot more thrust than the big rocket can doing it all at once. And so the way I... Speculating. Yeah. Speculating. If you had like a moon colony in the future, for instance, this would be a more cost-effective way of sending like small supplies and small batches. Probably not very economically feasible, but... Well, for the moon, probably not because there's not much more energy needed after you get into geostationary orbit at high Earth orbit mm. than to get all the way to the moon. It really makes a difference for Mars when you're far away. And the reason for that is you, you have to go 45 to 120 million miles, right? And so no matter what you do, you're going to have a lot of time before you get there. And if it takes you at a low acceleration, it takes you a lot longer to get to a high speed, but you can keep accelerating to higher and higher speeds, and it's going to take time anyway. So if you have months to keep accelerating, you can shorten the total trip time dramatically because you get to higher speeds with these highly efficient low thrust systems. The moon is close enough that you don't have to worry about that too much. But these ion propulsion systems are, are too low in thrust to use with people right now. And so they're primarily used for small robotic uh, spacecraft. So that's an electric propulsion. Now, there, there has been work done in nuclear thermal propulsion, which personally, I really like. So instead of the energy of chemistry or electric and magnetic fields, it uses the energy of splitting atoms, fission, just like in a nuclear power plant or in an uncontrolled reaction, which you and I would call an atom bomb, right? If you release that energy slowly, you can superheat propellant to much higher temperatures than are possible with chemistry and get them to accelerate your spacecraft. And you can get a specific impulse almost twice that of a chemical rocket. And the nice thing is it's still high thrust. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for heavy systems, you get the advantage of higher ISP, but you're not sacrificing thrust which means you can move big things like human habitats, okay, instead of small spacecraft. So my favorite technology for enabling us to do routine travel to and from Mars and perhaps out to the asteroid belt and maybe even Jupiter with people, not just robotically, would be nuclear thermal rockets. And now this technology was demonstrated in the late 60s and then put on the shelf. And it's being revived today. DARPA is funding a, a flight demonstration of that. So there is a good chance that we'll see a nuclear thermal rocket fly within the next few years. Now, stepping back from the science, I can imagine the problems that you have with completely safe sources of energy that are you know, very, very clean, actually, cleaner than most of the renewable resources that we use to produce power. There's this fear, right, that came from you know, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima. Is there similar problems in a public policy standpoint dealing with that sort of fear that have put the brakes on nuclear thermal all the way back to the 60s that are still a problem? Or is there kind of a way to get around it? And let's kind of do this one shortly, but I just, I have to raise the question. And you use the right word, it's fear. It's not based on real data. The, the way that this would happen is Reactors in their basic fuel, the nuclear fuel, is not very dangerous until the nuclear reaction is initiated. And these are radioactive materials, yes, but there are radioactive materials all around us, right? You're, right. I'll, I'll, is that, and it's got americium in it. The ground, if you live in where I live, we have radon gas problems. Well, that's caused by the radioactive decay of uranium in the soil, right? right. So there's radiation all around us. The fuel that's in one of these reactors, before you put it together and get it to the point where it's called critical, where the neutrons are banging into the atoms and splitting the atoms and releasing all these dangerous radioactive byproducts, the fuel itself, before you initiate that reaction, is not that dangerous. You could take the fuel from one of these uh, reactors that I think they're talking about flying, and you could put it on your, your dining room table and have dinner. 
And unless you reached out and scraped it to butter your toast, right, and then ate it, you would be fine, okay? So a launch accident is not really, because of good engineering, going to be a serious radioactive risk because the reactor would not be fired up until it was on Earth escape, until it's in deep space. A conventional chemical rocket would lift it out of the biosphere, which is what we're worried about, and put it into space, which is already filled with deadly radiation, thank you very much, to the sun. And that's when you'd get the reaction mass to go critical to heat the propellant to take you to the other destinations. So, so you like could launch this stage. very safely. Right. Yeah. Or I mean, that's probably not technically correct, but it's like the the first stage once you get to space. Right. You're correct. Right. Yep. You could do that pretty safely. Now, the beauty of this is it lets you take a lot of mass. And the, the nice thing is because it's got twice the efficiency when different space agencies, NASA, the Europeans, the Russians, look at what it would take to send a round trip of people to and from Mars, it ends up being multiple rocket launches to assemble the craft in orbit, in large part because most of the mass that goes up is fuel. Yep. Okay. This cuts the fuel load in half because it's got twice the efficiency. So that makes a huge difference in the total mass. And remember F equal MA. If you cut all that mass of fuel out, the same force is going to accelerate you to a higher speed so your trip time shorter. So nuclear thermal compared to chemical is really a good deal for people, for transporting people interplanetary distances out to about Jupiter. But that's where it breaks because even fission can't give your rocket propellant enough oomph to get the speed high enough at high enough efficiency to travel in realistic time frames further into the solar system and back. Right. And that's where you get into propulsion we haven't built yet, but it ought to be possible. Things like fusion. Just recently, right, there was a successful experiment, at least with fusion energy at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, right? Absolutely. I mean, fusion is kind of the, the holy grail for clean energy here on Earth. It's what powers the sun. At the center of all this mass of the sun, you know, a million Earths will fit in the sun. The sun is big, okay? And all that mass squeezes on the middle of the sun, and it's mostly hydrogen, which means at the center of the sun, you got all this weight of hydrogen squeezing these atoms together, and they fuse to form helium. And when they do that, in that fusion reaction, they give off energy, and that energy outward pressure is what keeps the sun from collapsing. So they're kind of a balance between all that mass squeezing on it and the pressure outward that keeps the sun stable. And all that energy coming out is what heats the earth, gives us light, lets us see. It's all produced by fusion at the core of the sun. If we can do that on earth and get more energy out than we put in to cause it, then we've got a clean power source for the surface. Then if you can miniaturize it and put it on a spacecraft, we'd have a fusion reactor to heat our propellant in our rocket and that would give us the rest of the solar system. Oh, wow. Its ISP and thrust would be high enough that we're talking sending people to Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. I mean, that's what we so need. Let, let, let's say we got to that point. What are the theoretical speeds, not speeds, but you know, kind of round trip or one-way trip, let's, let's start with, to get to, say, Pluto with a fusion propellant? Is there somebody you're wanting to send? Plenty of people I'd like to send. <laughs> on a one-way trip to Pluto, you'd still be talking about years, but it would be like three to five, maybe six years. Oh, wow. You could do that. There would be people who signed up for a mission to Pluto. I, I guarantee it. I think a third of the people listening to this would say, yeah, maybe, you know, when I'm a little older, I might want to do that. That might be kind of fun. Not me. Well, I want to come home. I want to have a round trip. I want to go back outside and enjoy these beautiful spring days. Well, there's also other problems that are unrelated to propulsion, like whether or not your eyeballs would stay in your head. Oh, yeah, yeah. And eating and, and staying alive from the radiation and all those kind of things. I, yeah, just talk about propulsion. But there are even better types of propulsion. This is where I get really so excited. So, Les, are you because, saying, wait, there's more? Wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to use a rocket, there is a type of rocket that can take us to the stars with a realistic trip time. There are two. And in the progression here, I'll talk about one, then I'm going to backtrack and talk about the other. Antimatter propulsion. 
antimatter is real, very real. And when I talk about antimatter, it sounds woo-woo and science fiction-y, and it is, but it's also very real. It's measured all around us. In the upper atmosphere of the Earth, it's produced all the time. And you have these cosmic rays, which are high-energy atoms of iron, carbon, other things that have been accelerating across the galaxy, probably blown out of a star when it went supernova and exploded. Mm -hmm. And it enters the atmosphere really, really fast and hits oxygen, nitrogen atoms in our atmosphere. And as they smash together at high energy, it releases a secondary particle cascade of all kinds of things, electrons, muons, mesons, other atoms, you name it. And occasionally, you'll get what looks like an electron, same mass as an electron, but instead of a negative charge, it'll have a positive charge. That's a positron. And you'll get an antiproton. It'll be something that is heavy and looks just like a proton, but instead of a plus charge, it'll have a minus charge. Those are created. And what happens is they quickly encounter other material in the atmosphere, which is not antimatter. And a real interesting thing happens. It's called annihilation. I love it, right? Right out of your science fiction novel. Right. Annihilation is basically Einstein's famous equation. Everybody get ready. E equals mc squared. Energy and matter are equivalent. And you can convert one into the other. And antimatter is one way to do that. So the energy of released when a proton encounters an antiproton, all of their that mass is turned into other products and gamma rays and all kinds of stuff that comes out. And it's a 100% energy conversion. So it is the most efficient battery nature can give us. Okay. So if you can make a lot of antimatter and store it so that it doesn't interact with normal matter, which is the challenge, you could use a little bit of it at a time to heat your propellant to make your rocket. And then you would have a travel time to the stars. You could do it. You could go to Alpha Centauri with a trip time of decades. Okay. Instead of with a chemical rocket, 70,000 years. So it really makes a huge difference. Now, if you want to know where air time matter is in your everyday life, look no further than the banana. Bananas have a small amount of radioactive potassium in them just because they absorb it from the ground where bananas are grown. And over time, that potassium will decay into other elements, just radioactive decay. When it does, it gives off antimatter. And that antimatter quickly encounters normal matter in the banana, annihilates, no radiations that you know affects you is emitted. But with really sensitive radiation detection instruments, bananas are mildly radioactive, as are Brazil nuts, okay? Because of the soil they're grown in. So if you want to scare people, <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Did you know this is a radioactive banana? The thing is, though, we, we're used to that. Our bodies are accustomed to that. It's not a threat. It's a very small level. But nonetheless, it's there. So this kind of stuff is science fiction sounding, but it's very science, very real. Okay, so you have antimatter. Yeah. What, what else? What's okay, I'll give you my favorite. That's one of my favorites. The favorite story for this other one is I, I met the guy who came up with it and had a great, great time with him. Have you ever heard of Project Orion? I believe I have, but okay. explain it for the audience. Yeah. Okay, I'll explain what that is. Back in the 50s and 60s, military people thought we'd be fighting a war in space, like launching battleships <laughs> to fight Soviet battleships in Earth orbit, right? So they had to figure out how we were going to get our craft up there quickly and with enough mass, with big guns, to fight a war in space. Well, a team of which Freeman Dyson, famous scientist at the Advanced Studies Institute, if I'm not mistaken, if he was a part of this team, and he came up with this idea. Imagine this thought experiment. You take a submarine, make it so that it'll you know, go into space and people can live in it, and you put it by big shock absorbers, like shock absorbers the size of your house. Okay, on a big steel plate, 
that's as thick as the first floor of your house. And underneath it, you start detonating hydrogen bombs, <laughs> one every few seconds. That explosive force is going to kick that up and launch it from the ground. I mean, people blow up stuff all the time, right? Blow up a rock, the rock flies into the air. This is a controlled explosion. Boom. But you do it every three seconds. Boom, 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 boom. You get going really fast, really quickly. You get out of the gravity well. You keep firing one every three seconds. Boom, boom, boom. You get up to 10% the speed of light. You're on your way. The drawback, of course, is you destroy the whole planet. So, you know, you don't want to do that. But it's not impossible. It would work. There's no doubt about it. It would work. And I got to meet Freeman Dyson at a meeting a few years ago at Caltech where we were talking about how to make an interstellar spacecraft. And it was going to be an interstellar precursor, not go all the way to Alpha Centauri, but go, you know, 500 times longer, farther than Voyager kind of thing. And the organizers of the meeting, before Freeman got there, he was getting kind of old at the time, they said, don't mention Project Orion to Dr. Dyson. He's embarrassed by it. OK, <laughs> so, you know, everybody always wants to know about Orion. We want to pick his brain on other things. Don't mention Project Orion. So there are about 100 of us there. and We all nodded our heads and said, sure. So it's day three. Last day, last afternoon. I'm eating lunch. Box lunch comes in. Les is eating. Who comes and sits right across from me? Dr. Dyson. Right. So I look around. Nobody's around. I'm not normally a rule breaker. But I said, you uh, went there, didn't you? I did. You I said, uh, dog, you went and, there. and I, I was at the point where we had talked before and he'd asked me about some of my work, which I haven't talked about yet. I want to talk about other propulsion that will get us to the stars too. But so I said, uh, Freeman, best buds with him now, you know, said, I have to ask, do you still think Orion is like a viable propulsion system? I'm telling you, this 80 some year old man lost 20 years in his countenance. He did. He lost 20 years. Big grin went across his face, and he said, yes. And he started telling us, started telling me, and it quickly became us, and it quickly became everybody, his stories of how they tested Orion, how they came up with it. They didn't do nuclear tests. They did non-nuclear tests. And there's a YouTube video out there that you can see where they the, the test of it they did with conventional explosives. It's silent from 1962 or something. But he told me that, the night before that test, they weren't sure it was going to work. They were on a Navy base. So they broke into the storage locker for the explosives, okay? Today, you'd be sent to prison forever for doing that. But oh, they goodness. broke into it, and they did a nighttime set of tests on some far test area away from where everybody was to make sure it would work before the VIP showed up the next day. So anyway, he was telling us all kinds of stories like that. It was great, <laughs> but that was my rule breaking phase. You know, I, I'm typically not a rule breaker. So those are really the rockets that are, are real that we might do. There are non-rocket ways to do propulsion also. Are you going to say less? What are those non-rocket propulsion systems? Less. What are those non-rocket propulsion? <laughs> there are a few. My favorite, and it's really the most mature of them, is something called a solar sail. Now, a solar sail works just like a sailboat on the ocean, sort of, uh, or a lake. When you're out on the lake with a friend in a sailboat, and they run the sail up the mast and they unfurl it, you have a, a, usually a cloth sail or a tarp or some kind of you know fabric. And as the wind reflects from it, it pushes it. So it's conservation and momentum. But instead of throwing your reaction mass overboard, you're reflecting something. It pushes you. So the wind hits the sail, bounces off, momentum is conserved, the sail goes this way, there's a mast, it drags the sailboat with it. Okay. When you get into space, and even here on the ground, the light that you can see reflecting, unfortunately, in my glasses is pushing on me because photons, particles of light, they don't have rest mass, but thanks to that woo woo quantum mechanics, they do have momentum. And so when light reflects from an object, it pushes on it and it loses a little bit of energy. So if you were a physics type and you were wanting to prove that, you would look at the color of the light that comes into a surface 
reflect it and measure the exact color of that which left, which tells you its frequency, and you would see that it would be slightly shifted toward the red after it reflects. Because as it gives me a little bit of its momentum, it loses a little energy and gets a little longer. The wavelength gets a little longer. Okay. Doppler shift, right? Yeah, it is exactly what it is. And so when you get out into space, if you deploy a large lightweight reflector, imagine something that looks like aluminum foil, but is much lighter weight. And you put it out there and you put it in the sunlight, sunlight's going to reflect from it and it's going to push it. Okay. That's pretty significant because the sun's always shining. And if you put that large lightweight reflective material out there, it's not much of a push. It's about like the thrust of those electric systems I mentioned earlier, but you get it without any fuel being used. So as long as you're flying where there's sunlight, you can keep accelerating. So a solar sail in particular is really good for missions that are inside the orbit of Mercury where the sun, not Mercury, they're really good inside the orbit of Mercury, inside the orbit of Mars where there's plentiful sunlight. Okay. And so that allows a spacecraft to reflect light for long periods of time, get up to high speed and go to places that it could not ordinarily go. The problem is it's extremely low thrust. And that means like an electric propulsion system, it's not going to work for missions that require people, at least not anytime soon, because we can't make light enough, big enough sails yet. But for spacecraft that weigh a couple hundred pounds, it's a really good way to get around the inner solar system very efficiently because its ISP is not 10,000 seconds. It's essentially infinite because you have no propellant. So you, as long as you're deployed and working, right. you keep, you just, you you just keep functioning. You keep accelerating as long as you have the lights. Keep going. And how this would reach the stars is if you deploy really close to the sun, where the sun is much brighter, get a lot more light per unit area on your sails, so you get a lot more thrust. That drops off as you leave and get away from the sun, but we could put lasers in space to keep shining light on the sail to keep accelerating it to higher and higher speeds. And so the latest papers I've seen that came from a group called Breakthrough Starshot out in California, where you are, they're looking at a laser light sail craft that if they can get the technology to work, which they haven't yet, but they're working on it, could get up to 20% the speed of light. Okay. We could send a probe to the nearest star that would get there in a few decades if they get that to work. Now, is it going to be tomorrow or the next day? Probably not. Might it be a few decades from now? Yeah, they might be able to get it to work. So I, I'm optimistic. There's no fundamental reason it won't. So surely that's not all there is. What other? Well, I mean, that's, that's the gamut of what's real physics and that I can envision as real engineering. There are other kinds of sails that push against the sun's magnetic field. They're called mag sails. Those could work. And the principle is basically the same as when you're a kid and you have two bar magnets, north poles, and you try to push them together and they won't go together. They push each other apart. Well, the sun's magnetic field, you can create a magnetic field around a spacecraft using electromagnets and they push against each other. And that would repel a spacecraft out. And you could go pretty fast with that. No one's really doing that because the technology to generate the really strong magnetic fields and get the power to do that, it's kind of low. It's not impossible, but it could happen. And there are these things called electric sails, which instead of using sunlight, use the solar wind, which are protons and electrons, and light charges repel. Just like north-north repels, a positive charge and a positive charge repel, right? And the sun streams out charged particles that are protons, positive charge all the time. So if you have a wire that's got a positive charge on it, those protons are going to push it. So you could also reflect solar wind as well as light to, to do propulsion. But that's really almost everything. There aren't many beyond that that are what I would say within known physics, if not known engineering. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Oh.